Professor Goldstein, when you were studying all branches of city management at the Fells Institute of Government, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania back in the 1950s, the water department, uh, the fire department, the schools. Did you ever imagine you would devote over 60 years of your life just to one branch of city government? Well, not at all. That, and that was a very exciting period because it was in the Clark administration. That everything was progressive and uh, new and uh, uh, had a great vitality to it. Um, no the answer, the direct answer to your question, but the interesting thing is that one of my assignments in that period of time was to do a study in the Philadelphia Police Department. Of the, of, it related to the uh, training of sergeants, and that put me out into the field, and I saw an aspect of policing that I'd never seen before. So you were very much a practitioner. You were in training to be a city manager and then you went on to work uh, with a city manager in Maine. So what were some of your other early experiences in, in dealing with the police that may have seduced you into this line of study? Well, one of the first was that when I was working as an assistant to the city manager in Portland, um, we had a uh, uh, need to study our police department and the city brought in O.W. Wilson, who was then the nation's leading expert with regard to police and I was assigned to staff him. And so that's how I met Wilson. And that accounts for two other very significant and influential experiences that I had. Because after that intensive uh, relationship with Wilson in Portland, uh, he invited me to become uh, a member of the staff for the landmark study of criminal justice in the United States that was sponsored by the American Bar Foundation. And it was a, an ethnographic study in which we were, and I was a field researcher for that study, and I was put out in the field and spent some two years in squad cars um, exposed to policing and uh, seeing what I would call policing in the raw, uh, policing in, uh, you know, on the street, which um, uh, was in sharp contrast to the image that people had of policing uh, uh, prior to that, and indeed in preparation for the study. And then my second major experience was after that, um, Wilson was appointed a superintendent of police in Chicago. And uh, because of the relationship we had established uh, in the earlier ethnographic study, uh, he invited me to become his uh, executive assistant. And so whereas the first experience was looking at policing from the bottom up, looking at the work the police were doing on the streets. The second experience was dealing with police from the top down. And of course, there'd been this major scandal in which police were committing burglaries in Chicago, which led O.W. Wilson to resign as dean of the School of Criminology at Berkeley to accept this appointment to clean up a very corrupt police department. And, and you were by his side with uh, no doubt lots of resistance. Yes, and it was a very, very, very uh, uh, exciting, interesting, and engaging experience. Uh, he, he was operating because of the uncertainty of the political situation under a contract that was guaranteed by Lloyds of London. Uh, and so with that security, uh, we went about totally redoing uh, the police department. And indeed, in that first year, there were some thousand employees that left, left the department. Uh, or were pushed. Or were pushed. Or were dead and were getting paid anyway, <laughs> as I recall. Right. And, uh, um, but it was, it, it was a fascinating experience because um, it exposed me to everything that one would want to be ex exposed to in policing. Uh, and uh, in that period of time, of course, Chicago being Chicago, uh, I got the opportunity to learn something about all kinds of crime from dealing with uh, the mafia and, uh, and uh, organized crime generally, uh, all the way down to how, how to deal with the shoplifting and, and uh, the minor things that fall to the police. Uh, it was also a, a very uh, a challenging period in terms of racial relations in that uh, given you know, it was 1960, we were trying to guarantee um, access to minorities uh, to public facilities. 
Uh, we uh, opened uh, uh, beaches that had been closed to black people on the south side of Chicago. Uh, we dealt with open occupancy and we had to uh, do much more to integrate the police department because prior to our coming there, uh, uh, people of color did not have the same opportunity for movement uh, in the department. But, uh, and then of course there was all the other issues about, uh, uh, you know, uh, relationship with the people who, and the, the, the impact that the police were having upon individual rights and concern about uh, uh, assuring that those rights were uh, guaranteed. Uh, so all those issues together um, were very, very, very challenging and convinced me um, and one of the reasons why I spent the next 60 years in policing, that um, there was a lot going on, these were issues of great, great consequence. And I think the other thing that was important that I'd like to mention is that unlike, say, the garbage department that I was working with up in Portland, um, I came to realize that the police department, I think, in all fairness, I judge, is one of the most important agencies of municipal government because uh, ultimately, quality of life in a democracy, it seems to me, depends upon the quality of, of its policing to a great extent. And I learned that in Chicago. And the first book that you wrote here at the University of Wisconsin Law School on policing a free society made a very uh, excellent statement of that complexity, uh, which uh, many scholars have, have learned from. But after this four-year turbulent period in Chicago uh, and, and your movement to academic life, um, how, how did the world of policing in the United States change as the civil rights movement heated up and here you were in an academic environment with very intense discussions uh, and indeed criticisms of the police. So how, what was it like to make that transition from the Chicago Police Department to uh, a world-renowned university? Uh, it was a very dramatic change, um, but it came at the right time and afforded me the opportunity to reflect on uh, uh, all the experiences that I had had up to that point. And to try to, it was an opportunity to try to put together the, the, the various pieces of the puzzle that were so perplexing to me. Uh, it was also an opportunity in terms of an outlet uh, to participate in some national studies that were provoked by, that were brought about because of the kinds of concerns that um, the, the community and the nation was experiencing at that time. And so, as you may recall, we had a sequence of, of commission studies, the President's Commission on Crime, the Kerner Commission, the Violence Commission, and uh, each of them turned to us here at the university for our, our contribution. And uh, it was in response to those requests that uh, I had the stimulation to engage in sort of the next stage of my career, which was to draw on the prior experiences, especially with the Barr Foundation study, in making recommendations as to what the needs of the police were in that particular era. And so we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the President's Crime Commission report, which had so many big ideas for trying to transform the police uh, in ways that you might now see as trying to change the, uh, the way in which the police organization operated. But by 1979, you had reached a very different view from what they had published in 1967. How did you come to make a, a view that the pathway of police reform was heading down uh, the wrong direction and that needed to be redirected towards, towards these results of police work? Um, I'm, I'd be happy to respond to that, but I think it's important to insert here that there was that period of time of about 10 years where, based upon the work of the Barr Foundation study, uh, a colleague of mine here at the law school, Frank Remington, and I uh, worked intensively on the um, effort to uh, to respond to the discovery of the Barr Foundation study relating to discretion and the need and f to guide police in how they are exercising their discretion. So that was the period of time I think that you're familiar with in which we uh, contributed to the development 
and the use of uh, an em em employing of, of policies within police departments, whether it was regard to use of force, use of stopping and questioning, use of surveillance, and all of those very sensitive, subtle uh, functions that police were performing. And just on that point, can I tell our audience that in 1971, the New York City police killed 93 people, and in that year, the police commissioner came here to Madison to talk with you and your colleagues about structuring police discretion, and police commissioner Patrick Murphy created a new policy on shooting, and within 10 years, they dropped from 90 down to about 10 people a year being shot to death by the New York City police. I think in no small part uh, reflecting on the conversations that you had here in Madison. Is that all accurate or do you want to... Uh, oh, I, I uh, take great me? pride in the, uh, the degree to which the whole commitment to developing policies that were more restrictive than statutory authorization uh, contributed to the improvement of policing and the New York example relating to use of force policies back then is one of the best examples that we have of that. Uh, you know, prior to that time, if you looked at a police manual, it related, it guided police officers on how they should wear their uniform, how, whether, when they should wash their cars. Uh, we got injected into uh, uh, police manuals. Uh, many of these policies that spoke to the very sensitive authority that police were exercising in conducting searches, in, in, in deciding whether or not they should conduct surveillance, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that was a very important era that was made possible by my being in an academic institution and having the opportunity to work with people like Pat Murphy and other chiefs around the country in promoting those reforms. But in an important way, focusing on the policies was a, a, a sort of bridge into this question of what are the results of the policies. Exactly. And, and so tell us how you came to develop problem oriented Right. Um, in addition to working on the policy uh, material, um, this was a period of time in which I became uh, increasingly disenchanted with the model that was in place for reforming police departments. And the basis for my disenchantment was that I came to realize that the police function was almost an impossible task. It was, public expectations were totally unrealistic still are to some degree. Um, the police function was defined in part as it's anonymously as law enforcement, when in fact police spend a relatively small percentage of their time just enforcing the law, that they're doing so many things in addition to enforcing the law. The job of the police is so varied and extends over a multiple you know, range of tasks and responsibilities relating just all the way from protecting constitutional rights to uh, avoiding and dealing with conflict to, uh, to caring for people who can't care for themselves, all in addition to dealing with crime. And the problem here is that uh, this mission that they have is constantly increasing reflect on the past uh, few years. Terrorism, immigration, opiates, uh, driving while distracted. These are all big, big, big problems that have been inherited by the police and they take these things on without being relieved of some of the things that have been piled on in them in the past. And the bottom line to all of this is that they are not systematically provided with the resources, the authority, and the staffing with which to do all these things in a way that is appropriate and adequate. And then we, we, we develop the problems. The problems that, uh, you know, being that they then have to fall back on the criminal justice system. They have to fall back on imp improvising in order to get their job done. Uh, and they have to vol fall back on their aura of omnipotence, you know, that they can, they're supposed to be able to do these things, and that can sometimes go awry. And they also tend to fall back on um, um, resorting to generic responses to problems. 
stopping and questioning, for example, without the specificity, without the surgical uh, application as to how, where those procedures might best be applied. And that creates problems for them, and that makes, as I say, the job somewhat impossible and unrealistic in terms of its being a clean um, description of, of what we expect of them. So with your 1979 paper launching this idea that has now been recognized by the International Jury for the Stockholm Prize as one of the major events in the history of democratic policing, how would you define for the mass public that's never heard of this what police uh, doing problem-oriented policing uh, consists of? In the past, police efforts to, to improve were focused for the most part on management, on the organization, on the staffing, uh, in order to try to deal with all those things I've just described. And I came to realize that that was not an effective way for bringing about the needed change. Something was missing. And what I feel was missing was that not much of their improvement efforts, much of the effort they invested in reform from within policing and by, and by the community was, that was focused on management wasn't having the impact that we wanted it to have. And that a portion of that effort should be advanced, devoted to looking at the outcomes of what police are doing. To ask the question, we have this large police department they're there to do something, and, and what do we want them to do, and how are they doing that, and with what effectiveness? And so I was anxious to move police departments from concern about efficiency to effectiveness, from a concern about management issues to a concern about the substance of policing, the matters that connected with the citizens out there who were looking to the police to deal with their problems. And my, I, I, I hypothesized that if we could get police themselves and others to move in that direction, we would have a clearer understanding of where we were going and, um, and we would be able to accomplish more that resulted in a police operation that was both fair and effective. So in recent years, the Scottish, Dutch, Swedish police have all gone through turmoil and turbulence in reorganizing their police without, as I understand it, much of a clear focus on how the result should be different. Uh, it sounds like that's a good illustration of what you were trying to say back in 1979. So if instead of doing that they had focused on problem-oriented policing, what would you have said they should do? I think uh, what I proposed in, in 79, which was at that point perspective, hopeful, uh, dreamy a bit, uh, has, has become fr a firmer in my mind as a, a plan for moving in that direction. And what it involves is for police agencies, and here we're asking the police to get more involved in the concern about substance, to focus for their reform efforts on specific micro problems in their community, not take on the world but take on specific problems that arise um, and, 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 and to zero in on them, dig deeply as to that, those, each of those problems. Not many of them at one time, but you know, if, if one department did three or four of them and another did three or four of them, collectively we'd be accomplishing a lot. And uh, in zeroing in, uh, end at a position where you, the police officers and the, the, the analysts that were involved felt that they knew all that there was to be known about that particular problem and to think about alternatives for dealing with it, tailor-made alternatives, responsive to that particular problem. And, uh, and, and in, in the course of doing that, to place their emphasis on prevention, on avoiding dependence upon the criminal justice system, and on engaging others, the community, the private sector, 
and other public agencies. Uh, and having done that, uh, coming up with a proposal to implement it, somewhat experimentally, but to implement it in a way where they could measure the results of what they were doing and, uh, and uh, hopefully do so in a rigorous way, although we, we, were, we, were, we were realistic that police were, did not have the, all the staff and the assistance that they needed to do that in, in a rigorous way. But um, coming up with results that could be shared with others and other police departments and uh, ultimately um, shared in such a way that it becomes a body of knowledge which elevates the quality of police agency responses to a multitude of micro problems. So that's the strategy. What are the specific elements or tactics of carrying out that strategy one micro problem at a time? Well, I could walk through that, that formula and, and try to, to expand. Uh, for example, um, the zeroing in on micro problems. Um, to, to illustrate what, what I see there is that we, we have to wean the police away from the public expectation of just going out there and dealing with crime, with violence. Um, or uh, with a, a sense of a lack of security in the community. Uh, I think we can best realize progress if we ask the police to zero in on the problem of, for example, theft, not just theft, mm -hmm. but theft of aluminum, not just theft of aluminum, but theft of aluminum that is removed from houses and maybe not even that, that general, removed from houses in the such and such neighborhood. Or led from the roofs of churches in England, which has right. been a huge problem. <laughs> right. But it's just churches. Right. And if we can identify the problems that arise in the community with that specificity, then to really drill down and say, what do we know about how this is happening? And who is involved? And what the motivation is? And where do they dispose of the, of the materials that they acquire, et cetera, et cetera. And our experience in problem-oriented policing is when that is done, you, and you get to the end, you say, oh, what we ought to do is gain control of how the individuals doing that are disposing of their aluminum and transforming that into cash. And in fact, in Britain, using just the method you've described, they identified that the scrap metal dealers were not required to keep uh, digital records. And so they stopped, uh, by law, any cash transactions and required credit card for all scrap metal purchases by the dealers in the UK. Just what you are pointing to as a theory which became practice in England. And that, that routine and going through that process applies in a number of areas. Uh, uh, just as we did for porn shops for many years, we required people to leave certain goods at a porn shop for several days so that they could be checked against um, police department records as to what had been stolen in the community. Uh, and then uh, only provide the cash for what it was left uh, several days later. And the same kind of mechanism was, uh, was ended up being useful in the control of the theft of aluminum. But one could go to numerous other examples. Instead of dealing with you know, the notion of just robbery in the community, it, we can deal with it much more uh, effectively if we, if we think about uh, robberies at ATM machines or robberies at ATM machines in a particular area which then leads you into explorations of lighting and location of the machines and a lot of other considerations. And uh, ultimately uh, directs you to some alternatives you might put in, put in place for the prevention and that are not dependent on just looking for offenders and are not dependent on uh, uh, trying to process those people through the criminal justice system. Now, Bill Spellman and John Eck have developed a, a now famous acronym of SARA, Scanning, Analysis, Response, uh, Assessment. With those four steps, identifying the, the problem 
analyzing it, doing something about it, and finding out if that works. Is that a fair summary in your view of the specific elements, or do we need a, a, a more detailed understanding of that? I think in the 38 years since I first articulated this, um, um, the, the CERA model was extraordinarily helpful and continues to be helpful in trying to uh, embed this concept. Um, I think we have advanced to the point where it's much more elaborate now. And, and it, so it, it tends to be used sort of as a crutch, but a very useful crutch. Uh, but uh, as to each of those steps, I think we've refined them a great deal and can, for the interested parties, uh, give them uh, many more details as to uh, how best to carry this out. Well, now, uh, most Western societies, uh, for a variety of reasons, are, are facing not so much a crime problem as a problem of relationships among diverse groups through migration, through uh, different races that have been living together for a long time, but uh, which have faced renewed uh, uh, conflicts and, and uh, highly emotional situations. How, in, in relation to race, diversity, migration, how does problem-oriented policing uh, become a tool that can be used to, to manage those kinds of problems where counting may not be so easy, but uh, the, the ultimate outcome is extremely important for the society? Well, of course, you're referring to, alluding to what is the number one problem in policing these days, and, and that is uh, the relationship between the police and, uh, and minority groups and, and people of color. Um, I have often contended that the uh, tensions that uh, arise in societies such as ours in the States, that is so diverse, multicultural, et cetera, uh, often become the number one concern of the police, sometimes exceeding that of crime. Uh, it's there. We've had numerous agendas for how best to deal with it. Um, problem oriented policing, um, I, I would not imply or want to suggest that it is the solution to that problem. It is one of a number of, of, of methods by which to try to deal with the larger problem, which is now per pervasive. Uh, how does problem, per pro problem oriented policing contribute? Um, uh, at the root of a lot of the episodes, incidents, concerns that we've experienced in the area of, of, relation, of race relations, uh, there is often, uh, and, and, and the commitment to uh, e equal treatment, to control over use of force, etc. there is at the root of a lot of these things an episode, an incident that police were called upon to handle which, had they used uh, some of the benefits of problem white policing, may not have handled, uh, may not have occurred, in, in the sense that uh, the whole thrust behind, there are the two, two major elements of, of problem white policing that are responsible. One is that it is, committed, it is committed to refining the police response. And to the extent that we engage in refining the police response, we often end up with an alternative that is less adversarial uh, and that is more effective and fair. And that's directly responsive to some of the undercurrents that contribute to our tensions. The other, to which we may speak in more detail later on, is that it contributes in a very meaningful way to engaging the community. And so if you, in solving the problem of theft of aluminum, uh, constitute a committee in the area where that is a problem, and there are members of the community that are engaged in looking at that problem, the kind of engagement that that brings about uh, contributes enormously to improving relationships with the community because all parties involved get an insight into what policing is all about, and it establishes a forum in which police and the community engage that brings about a better relationship and a better understanding between 
parties that otherwise might be um, distant from each other. And so the current race relations, at least in the United States, uh, would suggest that not enough use of problem-oriented policing has been made in the area of race uh, and policing. But overall, in general, how would you assess the extent of implementation of problem-oriented policing, at least in the United States, uh, in, in the years since 1969? How do you perceive its, its progress, its spread, its being adopted or not being adopted? And um, uh, no, nobody, I think, is expecting that the entire world should have adopted it, but uh, uh, your opinion about how far it's gone and how far it has to go is, is very important. Well, my perspective is, is perhaps very unique, and others can better inform it than, than perhaps I can. Um, it, when I first threw this out, it was, you know, here it is, folks, work with it. And I didn't know if, any, if anything would take off or not. A lot of things did. There were, there were some pockets of activity that were very uh, broad, expansive, intensive, uh, and a lot of projects were, were uh, got off the ground. I have the feeling over the period of time that it's been very uneven. Uh, but I must tell you, from, for someone such as myself, it's very frustrating because unlike um, some of the people who have uh, won the, this award, um, it, um, you know, where they build very logically one thing on the other, uh, this was a matter of broadcasting an idea. And people might have picked up on it, they might have distorted it, they might pervert it. Uh, it comes back to me sometimes in a form that I don't even recognize. Um, I, I have found no easy way of measuring it. And so it's very uh, satisfying to me to see uh, it recognized by others. And they say, well, it's really going on. For example, we, um, the Problem Morning Policing Center that, uh, that uh, houses and archives much of the work relating to uh, Problem Morning Policing, has um, managed to produce some, uh, I think it's up to 20 manuals on how to, um, to engage in Problem Morning Policing. 20 that have been translated in 20 different languages. And, and uh, uh, I find that impressive, but I can't even tell you if anybody has used those manuals in the nations in which, to which the, the, the manuals have been uh, you know, translated into their languages. Uh, so we have no systematic feedback. There's nobody counting anything. There's nobody evaluating what's going on out there. And uh, um, so it's hard to keep track. But you are, I think, our first winner whose work uh, was selected uh, primarily because of its impact as opposed to, in the more classic scientific uh, mode, the, the quality of the idea itself and its potential for impact uh, if, if it was uh, adopted. I, I'd have to say that there's massive adoption of your work to point to, but that's certainly not 100%. So let's just have the exercise. On a scale of 1 to 10, how far do you think we've gone in making democratic policing problem-oriented in its focus? Well, based upon what you've told me, I'd probably put that higher, but that's a relatively new piece of information for me. Uh, when I look at uh, policing in its entirety in this country, I don't see that much evidence of the adoption of the concept. And in large measure, and maybe we can get to talk to this later as to the, some of the impediments involved, in large measure, it's due to the enormous pressure that police agencies are under these days, uh, dealing not only with matters of race relations and, and crime, but with a lot, uh, some of these gigantic new responsibilities they have relating to terrorism and uh, the opiate mm -hmm. crisis. And uh, I can understand where the police agency and you know out there in one city this says, yeah, we just. We're, we're short of staff, and we're, we're running our tails off, responding to calls for help, and we don't have time to uh, engage in this uh, effort um, uh, being promoted by an academic uh, 
to do something that we haven't, we haven't been accustomed to doing. It, it takes some real adventuresome spirits to get into this area and some enlightenment. And of course in the UK with the cutback in the police budget and a drop in policing numbers from 140,000 police to 110,000, what they found is good evidence that if they focus on the problems then they can manage the demand uh, for police services much more rationally. And so the, it's not the impediment, it's the solution. Yeah, if, that's, if just that's, that's my, that would be my response to their concern about pressures, that if, uh, that if they were to take on some of their major, what they consider to be their major problems, and do this drilling down, and explore them in detail, and come up with alternatives, they may find that, it, that they can shrink the problem a great deal. And, and, and that's one of the objectives of problem-oriented policing, is to define the police function in a more realistic way that is possible of achievement. And so to point to some good success stories so that people have, a, a, again, a more concrete understanding, what would you say would be some of the best examples of, of getting better results through problem-oriented policing? Oh, I, I, in anticipation of this interview, I was thinking about what I might cite as the best example. I don't, I, I think I would be more helpful if I, um, I just came back from a, a, an annual conference on problem with policing, where they uh, honor uh, some of the best submissions uh, of police departments. With an award named after you, quite appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, uh, I'd like to re refer to a few of the presentations that were made at that conference as samples of what is currently being done because they illustrate the variety and also the depth and the, the kind of changes and advancements that, that are being made. For example, um, the city of Cincinnati that has suffered serious problems in, problem in, in uh, race relations was ordered by a federal court under a consent order to reform its police department using problem-oriented policing. And uh, having done that, um, they presented the results of one of the most recent projects relating to, um, to violence in, in one of their more difficult areas. Uh, it was an impressive presentation. And what they did was they decided um, that they had tried to deal with the, to come at it in terms of the frequent offenders that might be engaged in this. Uh, and that didn't work for them. And so they adopted some of the work being done in criminology uh, with hotspots uh, research. And they, they identified a number of areas that had a high rate of violence and shootings. And they uh, picked up, decided on just one area and they went in there, and as I use, re, keep using this term, they drilled down in the area and uh, involved the, in the community in this effort. And uh, over a period of about a year and a half, two years, uh, they did such things as uh, changing the, uh, the, the arrangements for parking in the area. Uh, borrowing from environmental criminologists and uh, so that they banned parking so that it was not so easy to conduct drug deals. They, they arranged for the demolition of some buildings in the area that were decrepit and, uh, and were being used by offenders. Uh, they created a new playground in the area. Uh, they improved lighting in the area, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they, just in that one area, and looking, having their eye on what was happening to other areas to be concerned about displacement, um, they saw a tremendous drop off in the number of shootings and a substantial increase in the number of days between shootings uh, in the period of time. And that was impressive to me because they used the work of other areas, you know, criminologists, environmental criminologists, uh, and it was done by the police department. It was done with the support of a trained uh, analyst, uh, and it was, it was a, just a very solid project. And that's one example that I brought away from the conference. And so this, uh, 
connection to other fields uh, uh, in criminology uh, would also include what uh, a previous Stockholm Prize uh, winner's uh, situational uh, crime prevention. Situational crime prevention. Right, and, and I, I failed to mention that part, of, several of the techniques employed in the Cincinnati study would fall under the category of situational crime prevention, which seeks to reduce the opportunities for crime, and for which Ron Clark is. Uh, 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 has been honored, and uh, you know, where he has hundreds of examples based upon some good, impressive scientific work of seeking to reduce opportunities as the primary means for um, reducing crime. Uh, uh, another example that you've heard about recently, or, or yes, back, yes, I, 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 I'm just full of such examples because I just attended this conference. Um, police officers from Victoria, Canada were confronted with a unique problem of, of uh, an encampment of the homeless on, of all places, the lawn of the provincial capital. And they were under enormous pressure to just go in and arrest those people in the very traditional sense, even though arrest under those circumstances, and all these people were indigenous uh, members of the community, uh, uh, all past indications indicate that arrest has all kinds of peripheral consequences that are negative in nature. And to the great credit of the Victoria Police Department, they refused to do so. They, they argued that these members of the community were, like all people in the community, their clients. And they felt that there were better solutions. And they, uh, in, in what was a rather tense situation, um, and unique for a police department to say no, and that talk about redefining the police function, uh, they uh, argued that we had to do something better to solve the need of these people. And so they uh, created a very positive relationship with the residents of this area, worked with them for a period of time in managing their encampment, and at the same time worked with the provincial government and others to establish uh, permanent housing for them. And I think at a after a period of roughly eight, nine months, I might not be exact on that, all the people from that encampment were moved into the housing that was prepared for them, and there wasn't a single arrest made. And uh, the task of dealing with that as a police function was eliminated. Uh, I, I just thought that was a classic example of a unique and different response from a police agency than is often the case. And also in the dimension of race relations. Since yes. Indigenous relations yes. with the police. And, 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 and working with the community. So it had all the, the positive examples that I try to look for uh, in some of these cases. And then there's another one, if, if we have time to get into it. Uh, at the, this recent conference, I uh, saw the results of this emerging effort to deal um, in a fresh way with domestic violence, and violence uh, between intimate partners. Uh, and it builds on the initial work uh, under the Ken David Kennedy in High Point, North Carolina. Uh, and that in turn builds on his earlier work uh, with regard to focused deterrence and with high risk offenders. But uh, there are several departments now, High Point being one of them, Chula Vista, California being another, in which they have put in place a graded response to domestic violence. And the police get involved from the beginning and classify these cases, class one, class two, class three, class four, in terms of their seriousness and the frequency with which they've had to uh, return to the scene. But in, the, in that period of time, they work with the offender and they work with the victim and work most intensively with the victim, providing the victim with support, revisiting the victim frequently, uh, communicating with both the victim and the offender, uh, and in the hopes that their contact and their support, positive support, making resources available to them, will reduce the incidents of violence, and hoping that a lot of these cases will be disposed of at grade one and they'll not have to advance to grade two, three, and four. 
And I'm just impressed at this as the, the beginnings, the seedlings for a whole new approach. Uh, and let, let me exercise the license saying against the a history of having been in this field now for approximately 60 years. The distance we have come, you know, from the days when, when I responded with those police officers to a domestic violence a case in uh, the ABA study or in Chicago. In the 1950s. In the 1950s, and the police would respond, and the, there were two questions. Has anybody been hurt? Has anybody been hurt and needs an ambulance? And if not, this is a civil matter, and you should dispose of it accordingly. And the, the police would uh, write it off. It was cleared, and that was the end of it. Uh, we've come a long, long way in, the, in, the, in experimenting with and responding to domestic violence. And I'm, in all my career, I'm most, most excited about this uh, most recent effort to respond to the uh, uh, to uh, violence among uh, uh, intimate part partners uh, in this graded sort of fashion. Now, those are some great examples of success, but uh, to come back to uh, the uh, huge scope for further implementation of problem-oriented policing, what do you think are the major obstacles that stop people who want to do it from being able to do it? Well, you know, it's hard to rate them because all of them are serious obstacles. First of all, we have 18,000 police departments in the country. They vary, I'd have to use a scale of 100, from 1 to 100. And in some, there's just not even an awareness of this kind of approach. Uh, but uh, there are many, among the more advanced and enlightened agencies in the country, uh, I'm very, very encouraged by their openness and their receptivity uh, to, the, the, to this approach. And the evidence they've given us that it may be uneven in terms of periods of time, that, uh, that they take it seriously and are capable of doing it. Um, I would say then, moving on, one of the biggest problems is the lack of a capacity to assess and evaluate our efforts. That um, historically, as you well know, Larry, the police field have been, they've been given the personnel, the equipment, the staffing, but we've been very chintzy in giving them uh, the talent that is required to analyze their operations and help them develop. Uh, and I think the police field has been cheated in, in the fact that they have not been given that talent. When or in the past, uh, I think under one of the recent administrations, the police departments were given, I think, 100,000 police officers or more. Uh, I, I forget the exact number. Uh, I, I, I approached the, uh, the U.S. Attorney General and I pleaded that perhaps for every hundred officers that they gave out to the police field, they should give them two or three analysts to, to enable them to make the best use of the hundred thousand police officers. Uh, that hasn't come about. And the police field has been starved for analytical skills. Uh, we do have analysts who uh, determine traffic, crime patterns, try, and they're doing a good job. We have analysts that, uh, that try to help detectives establish the identity of people who have committed certain crimes, and they're doing a good job. But we need analysts who do problem-oriented policing, who take on specific identifiable patterns of conduct and behavior in the community, analyze them in great depth, and help the practicing officers to arrive at more effective alternatives by which they can deal with them, and then be prepared on their, at their side to measure the impact of their efforts 
and, uh, and whether or not it is something that should be broadcast to others or should be amended and uh, altered in some way. Well, you'll be glad to know that at least some other countries are doing just what you recommended. And the Western Australia Police has just established a permanent position uh, as director of criminology for this ex explicit purpose. So the message is, is getting around the world. Maybe we can just get it back to the U.S., which brings us to the question of what can voters do in a democratic society to try to get their elected leadership to support a more problem-oriented approach at the local level or the state level. What do you, what do you think uh, a concerned voter could do if they like this idea and would like to see more problem-oriented policing? And uh, I, in, in moving into that area, I wanted to note that when you asked me about some of the barriers, one of the bar barriers is that we have, our public is not adequately informed about the nature of policing. They often operate based upon uh, mythical notions of what policing is all about based upon something they get from television and novels and, uh, and uh, not from an awareness of what happens on the street. And we, I urge police administrators that I work with to invest a substantial amount of their effort in trying to educate their community uh, as to what is involved in dealing in the, in the nature of the police function, what is expected of the police, what the capabilities of the police are, what they can, what they can and cannot do, and, and to help them to refine their, their operations. And uh, so the, the, all this fits together, as you can see, in that if we can better inform the community as to what to expect of their police, then that would support the, pol the police by operating through a problem-oriented policing um, uh, paradigm uh, to, to uh, be more successful in their, their ultimate efforts and their, and, and their outcomes. Uh, I, I am pleased that when an agency does commit itself to a problem-oriented policing uh, project, that the, the, the nature of the project in which they turn to the stakeholders in the community, they turn to the, the, those who are, have an interest in this problem, are, are vested in it in some way, that one of the great results that comes out of that is a sense of understanding and, uh, and awareness of what the police are doing and it provides a much more solid basis for the community to support their police. So they're not just saying, something's wrong out here, I want to see more police officers in the area. Those two things don't connect very often. They're, they're all kidding themselves. Or when some of our mayors say, well, we've got a big problem next, next year, I'm putting in my budget a proposal for you know, 500 more police officers. Uh, that sends out you know, a feeling that, wow, and they, the, the, I suppose some people see a battalion of 500 police officers marching down the street to protect them. But let's be realistic. I mean, if you, just, you just have to do the math of that to begin with. If you just divide them up in terms of 24 hours, seven days a week, days off, days in court, etc., you're down to a much smaller number. And the question is, what do they do? And I've often made the case that we're beyond the stage of that old management model that I referred to, where we took satisfaction in the fact that we could, we could get the police to your home more rapidly. And police chiefs would go to a conference like the ISCP conference, and they would compare their response times. Well, we're down to 3.4 minutes. We're down to 2.6 minutes. The question is, so you get there quickly. What do you do? And with what effectiveness? And with what fairness? We've got to change the paradigm. And that's what I'm going to get people to do, is to focus on to what avail, what's the impact of what it is that they're trying to do. So to, to improve public understanding uh, about what police uh, could be doing that would work much better than the current uh, model, uh, to increase the analytic capacity uh, of the police. Those would be two things that problem-oriented policing needs to flourish. 
Any other big things that you want to communicate? The other big thing is the administration of our police agencies. Uh, we do not have the continuity that is needed to develop the momentum for moving in this direction. Uh, the average tenure of a police chief is probably, it has varied, it's probably around four years. If anything, it might have gone down. Um, so we've had experiences and we've had police chiefs who understand this concept and promote it only to find that they are no longer in that position. Um, and then apart from the tenure and uh, we, of course, have to have police chiefs who are understanding of this, committed to it, aware of the dynamics, and not distracted by the day-to-day -day pressures to which they are subjected. And that's a tall order. My heart goes out for the average police chief these days uh, and the kinds of things that land on his or her desk. Um, they're overwhelming. And so it's hard to introduce new concepts. But on the other hand, I've seen police departments that have operated as problem oriented policing departments and where everything gets translated into that language, like a vocabulary. And at a conference, at a, a, a weekly conference, the police chief will say, well, now, if we looked at this from the standpoint of a problem oriented uh, project or concept, what would we do? And push his staff people to think about the ultimate outcome of what they're proposing. And when you get that adopted as the language of the department, that's when I say, you know, we've won it. Uh, I recently went to lunch with a, a, a police officer, uh, and uh, he was telling me about some of his real activity and uh, what he was doing. And obviously this was, a, and I say this as an enlightened officer, because I just had a high regard for his career and what he, what he did. And he was telling me about this case he was working on. And he says, at that point, he says, I decided I had to pop it. And I said, what do you mean, pop it? And he was using the acronym Problem Oriented Policing. P -P. Yes. And he took the case, and instead of just referring him here or referring him there or writing out a report, he decided to take that on. And he dug deeply to find out what was going on here. And he discovered answers that led him to make suggestions that resulted in preventing this activity from going on in the future. So to pop the problem. <laughs> it's language I had never heard before, but it was often, but I say talking about adopting the vocabulary, at this, in this department, it had moved all the way down to the point where police officers were thinking in those terms, and that was very satisfying. So uh, to sum it up, where do you think the potential for problem-oriented policing um, around the world stands today? Does it still have uh, a, a good chance to make continuing progress, not overnight, but uh, are, are you guardedly optimistic that we can continue to make progress? Uh, or, or is it uh, too much it, to, in the era of terrorism and all these other problems? I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't resign myself to believing it's too much. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be slow. But I have renewed uh, enthusiasm uh, for the concept based upon the examples that come to my attention. And I feel there's a certain common sense logic to all of this. That is, I know it's dangerous. I think you and I have even talked about this in another context in the past. It's dangerous to make analogies to the, to the medical field. But what we're talking about here is uh, you're not focusing on, uh, on how long a patient has to wait for the doctor. That's important. And the, 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 the nature of the waiting room and the relationship with the doctor and the patient, but on the quality of, of medicine in terms of the impact it has on the condition of the individual. I think there's a parallel here. And just as the medical field is talking much, much more about uh, focusing their measurements on, on the quality of care, uh, so uh, I think police have to talk about, focus on this as well. 
And I think policing, even though it's so much cruder and rougher and unpredictable, there's a surgical element to it. We want to move more and more to the surgical element where we don't do unnecessary damage in the course of trying to do good. And we reach out to people and to the community in ways that ultimately have uh, an effect that is both effective and fair. Well, on behalf of the international jury for the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, let me just say that uh, part of our reason for selecting you to win the prize was our hope that it would bring renewed reinforcement uh, to all of the good work that has happened with your ideas uh, in, in the last uh, 40 years or so. And uh, we want to thank you for all you've done and thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.